Our second speaker is Professor Herbert Helm, Professor of Psychology. He is a man of many talents because he's both a psychologist and an award-winning uh, watercolor artist. And he's going to talk to us about a connection between art and psychology. That is, when you draw a picture, where do people look? So uh, being a psychologist, you know, there's, there's a lot in terms of uh, addictions and that kind of thing. And um, so when you're addicted to something, I think you're supposed to give your name and then tell you what you're addicted to. And so, you know, hi, my name's Herb, and I'm a watercolor workshop junkie. Um, actually, I didn't really get into any level of art until I was like in my late to mid-40s. And, um, but w what I did do before that was teach a class called learning. And in learning, we talk about things like perceptual organization, especially related to Gestalt principles. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen things like that. Uh, if you've ever taken an intro class, there's usually a picture that has a vase and a face, depending on which way uh, you look at it. It's called figure ground. And um, when we were talking about things like closure, I could bring in some artists and show how they hadn't quite completed the object, but you would, you would complete it for them. And at some point in these workshops, uh, the artists would usually get around to talking about composition. So composition was sort of interesting to me because I, it was like, okay, I got a little bit of sort of psych end of how you organize perception. Um, and they would, um, well, I, actually I pulled something from an article I wanted to read to you before I got too far into this. And, and I thought it, said, it probably said it better than any of the the people I took a class from. It goes, movement is the creation of a sense of ebb and flow through a painting, which turns it from passive wallpaper to a dynamic extension of the viewer's psyche, a creation of a interreaction that takes the viewer on the path of discovery. The artist is the conductor, bringing the viewer's eye through the painting using a myriad of techniques, which gives the painting a feel of motion either through space or time or even emotion. So some of this would be somewhat simple stuff, uh, probably stuff most of you would know, like um, in a painting there's a focal point. There's a point that um, is supposed to draw your eye into. That's supposed to be the first thing that you, you, you really get you know, tied into the painting with. Um, and almost all of the teachers at some point talk about different um, design elements. Now, if you go on the internet, they usually break it down to seven or eight or sometimes more. It just depends how they like to break it down. And they'll talk about things like line, you know. So we just saw some nice mountain pictures. And if you have a line of mountains coming down this way and a line of mountains coming down this way, and you've got a cabin right here, you know, well, that, well, those lines are going to pull you right into that cabin, right? And that, that's a pretty simple focal point there. Um, we can use focal points by creating high contrast um, or, or contrasting colors, uh, that, that type of thing. And then some of them would get really elaborate. Um, they would take a painting and go, okay, you're going to start up in this corner and that's going to move you over here to this. And, and because of the way this design is, it will pull your eye down here eventually, you know. And to be honest with you, it, it made logical sense. But since I also teach research methods, the question always came up to me, how do they know? I mean, how do you really know where somebody looks? And how do you know if that's the way they track it through a painting, right? Well. Luckily for me, and probably not so lucky for him, uh, I happen to have my office next to a cognitive psychologist who happens to do eye-tracking research. So I thought, huh, I should ha hook up what these people are telling me with, you know, actual tracking. Now, his eye trackers, or at least the ones we used at that time, can pick up 60 movements per second. Um, so we can, gauge, we can gauge to that degree. So 
Um, instead of using dead artists, because you know there's a lot of books out there telling you where you're supposed to look on various dead artist uh, paintings, but honestly, you can't really ask the artist, is that what you meant when you painted this? So we, I went out and found a couple of artists who were willing to work with me. Um, I'll, I'll show you his picture a little bit later, the, the one. Actually, I'll show you both of them, but I think what I'm gonna do before that is I'm gonna take you through the, the um, paintings that I got from these guys. Uh, what, we, what we did for our subjects is we were using undergraduate students. I'm assuming most of them did not have much training in art. And we hooked them up to eye trackers and then gave them one of two uh, conditions. One condition said, view the painting like you are in a gallery. And then the other condition was, view the painting like you're gonna get a test on it later. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna ask you some questions about this painting. We never did. Um, come to think about it, I don't think we debriefed them over that part, but uh, okay. And so we also wanted to see whether giving different instructions made a difference in terms of how you would look at art. Um, we hooked them up, and then for 30 seconds, we would have them look at each painting. Um, they would record it with the eye tracker, and then later we went back and made heat maps out of it. But what I thought I would do is uh, take you, it's not all of the paintings, but it's all the paintings that we, except for one, I think I'm using an extra one or two. Uh, we eventually did an article for Watercolor Artist uh, with our findings. Uh, the, the, the good part, or the bad part about doing this is you don't get much credit, but the good part is people actually read your article. Um, <laughs> you know, when you, when you do stuff like that. So what I thought I would do is uh, give you about 10 seconds per painting that I gave to the students. And, you know, I have, you have to go on self-report, which may or may not be accurate, you know, that this is where I'm actually looking and there's, this is where I'm focusing. But then I'll take you back through them and, and try to point out what, what we think we gained from this. So, and later we actually found that 30 seconds was just way too long. People got bored and started repeating stuff. And so when we finally analyzed it, I think um, Carl only used five seconds of, of, the, you know, of the look. So uh, as best as you can, and I'll try to explain later why I chose these pictures uh, in particular. So as best as you can, where do you think you're focusing?
Okay. So, like I said, we decided to use live artist. Um, earlier, you saw, very quickly saw the picture of the two of them. One of them is a guy named John Salomon. Uh, John Salomon is probably one of the most prestigious watercolor um, in the United States. He's won like 230 awards, a lot of them from very major competitions. Uh, he has signature status in multiple um, places, and He's been both judge internationally and nationally at least 70 times. I mean, you're, you're talking about a very, we were really lucky to get him. Um, he does most of what you saw as the urban art up there, okay? And then we used um, a guy named Terry Armstrong, who's more local from Warsaw, who, who's been an assistant uh, professor, I believe, at a local college teaching watercolor. Uh, it's won a number of local things, best of show, people's choice, that type of thing. So what we did with them is we then said, okay, what we want you to do is to then tell us where people will look. Now, we haven't been able to get the motion stuff yet, and Carl's still working a little bit on the computer stuff because he has to end up doing it by creating his own programs. But what you'll see is like on this particular one, that would have been what he's considered the first part that people would look at, followed by number two and followed by number three. Now, we didn't tell them other than, you know, they could use more than one spot. We didn't tell them how many places to, to put on the paintings. We just left that to them, um, totally abstract. So, um, when we get into the first one here, uh, one of the reasons this picture was chose is it just has a absolute blatant focal point into it. I mean, from any design issue that you could think of, right? And um, <clears throat> so what you're seeing down here is a heat map of it. This under the gallery instructions, and then this under the memory constructions that you're going to get tested for it later. Generally, what we found is that the memory ones, uh, people actually spread out a little bit more in terms of what they were looking at, I guess, assuming they were going to get tested on it. And, um, the, but the one that we did for the article, we're, we just looked at the gallery instruction one, but you'll see these uh, coming up on any of them. Um, so you'll notice he's predicting here, which is obviously a very good point. Um, but the problem, be, you know, and, by the way, the colors, so you're, you're being recorded at 60 times per second. So we sort of record you when you stop movement. And stop movement means that you got to be there for at least a fifth of a second. And you know, when you see the red, that means that the vast majority of people would have stopped at that location, that 75% or more. When you're seeing the blues, it's basically zero. People aren't stopping in those areas. So the closer it is to red, the more people are actually stopping there. The closer it is to blue, um, the less likely people are stopping there. And so what I thought I would do is then try to integrate both the photos and some of our findings together. Uh, the first one was we found out that in general, these artists were pretty good at predicting at least where what we call the hot spots are, you know, where they, um, where this is. Now, this becomes a little bit more interesting because you have this obvious focal point here, right? And let me actually go back to this one a little bit because you, we don't get it in a lot of the other pictures that I brought today. Uh, you'll notice you get these hot spots over here. And at some point, you've got to go, what are people looking at over there? You know, because they'd be looking up in this section. And uh, to some degree, not only did we find this in a lot of paintings, but uh, John helped us a little bit on this one. And he said he was at a show one time, and there's a bunch of little, you know, not little, you know, like adolescent, young adolescent kids. Uh, why they're at an art show, I have no idea. But they're looking at his paintings, you know, and, they, and, and they're looking, he does a lot of Chicago scenes like this. And they're looking at his paintings and going, wow, you would put like a sign of the bulls in the in the window, you know, which I, really from his perspective, I'm sure has nothing to do with what his painting is, you know. Um, but it, it got us going that people actually look at signs a lot. And in fact, if I go back a little bit, this, this one happens to be my painting. And a lot of these are way out of pixelation. Um, but 
this was just put in as a bus sign, and, and up here it says lake and state, and people actually spent time looking. Anytime you put words in there, it's like it helps people orient to um, where they're looking. So this one is also picked up because of strong focal point, and again, we get the focal point that's occurring that was predicted. Um, as we keep going through these, this one was actually picked because when I looked at it, I thought this, uh, this has actually three focal points to it, which theoretically, when you do a painting, you do it for a specific focal point, right? And um, lo and behold, what do we get? I mean, we get pretty strong, the three different... Well, this leads us to another problem that we have, and that is that you're going to see in a two or three of these that when you get high contrast, even if that contrast is not where you expect it to be, people will, will go there. And, and so you notice that up here, you, the, one of the problems is, is you've got a stoplight or sign or something that has a little bit of contrast, and in this case, we're actually getting people to sort of look there. Um, so we found out that, yeah, you put in more than one focal point, people are going to go there. Now, this one's a little bit interesting, and what you'll see is that people actually, yeah, we, we expect that to be our focal point, but this painting is, and so what I did was I grabbed some paintings that I considered did not have a lot of busyness, like the first one you saw. And then you're going to see some coming up here that have more and more busyness. And the question becomes, well, what happens to people when maybe the focal point isn't quite so clear? Well, yeah, we got the focal point, and he predicted up in here but if you think about what's down here, it becomes the reflection of the focal point, all right? Um, so we still, we still get that to a degree. Now this one I found interesting from two or three perspectives. You'll notice that he's predicting one, two, three, and four is where people will look. In reality, his prediction of one was very good. And what we found out across pictures is that people are interested in people, all right? And even if you're doing these elements of design, you don't want somebody to look a certain way, have the figure in the painting look that way, and people drift looking that way, right? So people use people, and you have high contrast, right? Very strong black against a whitish background. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. The name of this particular painting is Grant Lanterns. You might guess why. You're on Grant Street, and he painted lanterns, all right? So shouldn't people look at what you name your picture? Apparently not. Um, we get almost no red occurring up in here, as you'll see. You see a, just a hair right there, right? And if you look up in here, it looks like there's some writing up in there. Um, writing over here. You get writing in a paper, in, in a painting, and people are going to start looking at writing. We actually found out that... Um, where it was even semi-visible, uh, people were drifting down into the artist's signature. Um, you know, it's like, it's not just a signature, it's got to be writing, it's got to be something, you know. Well, what's bothersome on here? <clears throat> this one. <clears throat> obviously not predicted. This is obviously not a part of the painting, but it's what? Higher contrast. And... You'll see this in, an, in some of the other paintings. Now, this one I took because I, it, I looked at it and I thought, this is a little bit opposite, and so will people make any adjustments? I mean, usually you're going to see the darker, uh, less defined figures in the back, and then you pull the figures you want people to see up front, right? Well, he did the exact opposite. You know, he, he makes all the figures in the front dark, all the figures in the back, and lo and behold, it seems to make no difference. Uh, people are still much more interested in these people, even though we've, we've pushed them in the background instead of the foreground, or he has. Now, I picked this one because if you think about it, this is a tough, this is a tough sell on a focal point, right? Now, for him, and the name of this one happens to be Swatch, uh, because there's a Swatch advertisement up in there, right? So he's going one, two, right, and then three. He only predicts three spots on here. And, and that one makes a little bit of sense in that you got high contrast, but you got high contrast going across the whole thing, right? And actually, they seem to pick up a little bit more on this contrast, which would be closer. And what's not predicted is this too well. Um, the question becomes why. 
Now, he does predict here, and they look here, and they look here. And the answer, again, appears to be these are both faces. This, I, I, to, to this day, I really don't know what this is. I don't know if this is a sheep or a llama or, or whatever it is. I mean, it's some kind of an animal. But once again, um, that seems to really draw a lot. And if you think about the high contrast up here, very heavy dark against light, you get a little bit, but not much. Faces seem to pull more um, once again. Uh, this one brings out an interesting question, uh, because if you think about it, what do you got? One, two, th three. You got at least four that are very defined trillium, right? The question becomes, why do people only look at three of them? This one I haven't figured out yet, okay? Um, yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good light against dark, so that makes sense why this was probably a major trillium, right? Um, but then the question becomes, why the jack in the pulpit? There's no contrast. In fact, it blends into the background quite well. Well, once you get repetition going, when you find something that's very different in there, that also seems to be able to pull out what people are seeing. Um, Terry had a prediction that never came true. And you'll notice here, like on number four, and, and I, I, I see Terry on a more regular basis, so I asked him at one time, like, you know, what, why are you predicting over here? And he goes, and, and Terry does a lot of fishing up in Canada. He goes, I believe people are wanting to see what's around the corner. Well, apparently they don't. Um, you know. But what we do have again here is a high contrast area and what you do, and you see it a little bit more with the red over here. I mean, you expect that's where they're going to look, and that's where they look. But once again, these little pop elements seem to pull attention when we don't necessarily think that they should. Um, this one was not in our original article, but I found it of great interest. We found that roads do lead in. Some artists will argue they lead in, some argue they lead out. In every case that we had, they led in. What is much harder to explain, now if you really think about it, when this road leads in, it leads into nothing. And if you should have a good area of contrast, he's predicted right. Your biggest dark light area is right there. But as you notice, you're not getting a lot. You're getting it right here. The road ends, even though the road ends into nothing, that, that road seemed to, to still draw people in is what we found. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of mine. Now what we do believe is that if we ran different um, subjects, put, you know, we, we would get different results. Um, I'm actually half afraid to try to run artist, uh, because if you ever go and watch artist look at art, they're down in those corners that nobody looks at going, how did they do that? You know, they're looking at some technique element uh, that other artists wouldn't look at. Um, so we do believe that given different audiences, we would probably get different results. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay.